How am I looking? Can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Yeah, it looks like you're in the cleanest room in your house, too. It's nice. <laughs> it's a stage setup, man. <laughs> the rest of my house is a disaster. <laughs> sure. Let me get my background for you here real quick, Jeff. I'll show you this. Ready? Come on. There it oh, is. Good Lord. Is that the raccoon? Oh, that's a, ba a badger. It looks like the raccoon from Elf we get to when he attacks him. That's a 3.3 pound Pomeranian we had yawning. That's a dog? <laughs> yeah. Holy smokes. <laughs> yeah. All right, are we ready? We getting started? Yes, we're ready. Let's do this. All right, guys. Thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, this is an exciting class for me. It's something I started back in 2013 actually, and it just changed my life. Um, I talked to a lot of clients over the years, hundreds per month clients, and to the th tune of thousands per year, and a reoccurring theme keeps coming up over and over and over again, and it's about building wealth, like how do you save money, what to do, how do you, how do you get money to save is probably the biggest question, but then once you have money, what do you do with it? You just put it in a savings account and watch it grow that way? Do you throw it under a mattress or what? Um, so I started teaching this class about two years ago, and uh, we slowly have built up a lot of uh, following on the program and things like that. Um, today, I'm doing it a little differently. Um, I normally take a little more time to go through the personal family budget directly, um, but I thought it was a perfect addition to add a special guest on here, Brian Lockett um, from Commonwealth uh, Man. Uh, Comprehensive Wealth Management. Comprehensive, sorry. CWM, just call it CWM. I've known Brian forever, so, and I can't believe I screwed that up. But it, Everyone it does. Comprehensive Wealth Management. Thank you, Brian. Uh, even my parents screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for coming on, Brian. I really appreciate you doing yeah, this. Absolutely. And, Thank you for uh, having me. Sharing this uh, with our clients. I think this is going to be an amazing class. So, without further ado, let's get started on this and get, start, uh, get going. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, in my story, I go by the big old, bigger pile story, or big old pi bigger pile theory. And basically what that means is you can't teach a class if you haven't already lived it and shown the success of what you're teaching, right? Like if I'm broke and teaching you this class, I'm not doing you guys any good because I haven't experienced what this can do. Now with that said, I've been living this for four and a half years using these concepts. When I started out back in 2016, sorry, let me back up. I started coaching in 2013 and they started telling us about this program. I didn't actually start it until 2016 because I was wary. I didn't want to put the time in. I thought I could do it on my own. Well, guess what? You can't. <laughs> Nobody can. I think you need a system and you need a plan and you need to stick to it and you need someone to uh, follow up with you as well. So like when a I personal trainer. What's that? It's like a personal trainer. Personal trainer is exactly what it is. You need a financial, financial personal trainer. Really so guys, do. when I started out this, I had a net worth of $740,000, which is a lot of money, right? It took me 25 years to get that money. And it was all in retirement. I had no savings account. I had no stocks or bonds other than in my 401k. I mean, I thought I was doing a great job and I thought I was, I, I would say I thought I was wealthy because I had all this money. But little did I know is I was so short on retirement and basically retirement for me was gonna be, you know, at the end of my life, practically. I was gonna have to work until I was done. Um, so I started this program. I started using the personal family budget every month. I was coached on the personal family budget every month. And for two years, I did it religiously and just blew up my net worth. Initially, it took a little while to get the concept and get the feel of it and things like that. But now I am so dialed in that my growth, my wealth has been growing and growing and growing. Currently, my cash net worth is uh, over $2 million as of 2020. And that's just consistently staying to a plan and saving like a crazy man. Uh, just to give you an idea, this year to date, I've saved over $175,000. All that money has gone into stocks, 401k, IRAs, or, and anything else you can think of, just based on I save first. 
So now today we're gonna to talk about the six steps to financial freedom. Personal family budget is number one. Every month you gotta do a personal family budget. Hand done, not online, make it real. Track every dollar in and every dollar out. Save first and pay bills last. You guys, if you don't know how much you spend, you don't know how to save it. You got to know what your outgo is. And the surprising thing for me is I was able to trim thousands, and I'm talking about thousands of dollars out of my outgo by figuring out where all my money was going. It was and, so much money. And Jeff, Starbucks. wouldn't you, sorry, sorry. So Jeff, oh, wouldn't ahead, you also Jeff. say that it was a healthier thing too? Cause you probably didn't eat out as much. You didn't swipe that credit card at Starbucks and so forth as much. So not only were you saving money, but you had probably actually were healthier as a result. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I, I'm a fanatic to go out to eat. And I started to switch that, like you said, mm -hmm. where we budgeted to go out to eat once a week instead of three or four times a week. And that forced us to buy better food, salads and things like that. You're right. And it's way cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, there's no doubt. Yeah. I'm telling you, though, it was thousands of dollars. I mean, I have three kids and everything else. Money was going out all over the place and nobody <laughs> was tracking it. Yeah. And when you find that out, you can save a ton of money by just knowing where your money's going. Yeah. So the personal family budget is probably the hardest step because it makes you actually take a look at how bad things are. But it's the best step because it turns things around very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present it. I'll present a challenge here as well. Try to do as few transactions in a month as possible as well. In other words, be, try, to, try to group your transactions into it instead of a bunch of these little nickels and dimes everywhere. If you try to consciously try to group those in like, you know, I want to swipe the card 20 times this month or once a day this month and that's it. It will really make a big difference too because what happens is you start getting more conscious about what you're truly spending the money on. Yeah, I think getting cash instead of using credit, and we'll get into that too, will help mm -hmm. with that exactly Absolutely. what you're saying. It's kind of getting away from swiping your card every time you go to Starbucks, swiping your card every time you go pick up a, you know, a, a Coke you know, at the mm -hmm. gas station or whatever. You know, that, yep. that does. That saves tons of money. Yeah. Um, number three, survival account. It's, it's scary how many clients I meet that are looking to buy a house and don't have money for a down payment, which means they don't have money in a survival account to protect them in case of emergency. So we're gonna talk about that. That's probably one, a, a super important thing. It's the first thing you focus in on once you get your budget dialed in. Um, invest in a 401k. I think a lot of us have this on the top of our mind. They know it, they talk about it, the government talks about it. 401k is a really good investment and it is by far one of the best investments. And we'll talk about that and it's retirement first. We wanna get that money in there because of the the major advantages of the 401k or an IRA. Um, oops, invest in stocks and bonds, build wealth outside retirement. And this is the long-term key that I was missing. I had all this money in retirement, but you can't pull that money out until you're retired. That's the problem. So if you want to retire at 55 or you know, 52 or 50 or whatever it is, there is no possible way for you to do that if all you have is a 401k you're looking at probably 65 to 70 before you want to start pulling that money out. You can certainly pull it out sooner, but again, you're gonna be, I think it's gonna be a mistake. So we wanna focus in on building your savings and wealth through investing in stocks and bonds. And I'm sure Brian's gonna have something to say about that as well. Oh yeah. And then paying off the house, this is something I get all the time. I have clients that want a 15 year fixed, uh, or, or they just want to ask, hey, what if I pay an extra $500 a month to the mortgage? Now, my response typically is, is, well, do you have any other bills? Well, yeah, I've got credit cards. I got a car loan. I'm like, okay, don't pay off your house. The last thing you want to do is pay off your house. It's the very last thing. It's the, the best thing about owning a house is you can leverage that asset, and it's one of the best leveraged assets you can ever buy and there's no point in trying to pay that off. Matter of fact, Brian, you send me clients all the time to pull cash out. <laughs> That's <laughs> like, right. Like, hey, you got equity in there, pull it out and give that money to me and I'll invest it and I'll triple your return based on the interest rate or whatever. I mean, you're not promising anything. I take that back. Yeah, you're sleeping in your piggy bank, as we say. Exactly. I love that. That's a great term. <laughs> or is one so of my once you're over says, 50 and all five steps above have been accomplished, then you can start paying off your real estate. But a lot of people, when they retire, they end up moving anyways and selling their house. So again, it's another reason why I put money into your real estate. Build it through stocks and bonds and get a better return. That's right. 
So the four pillars of wealth, we have kind of covered a lot of these savings. You got your emergency account, you got your real estate, you're going to have to pay rent somewhere, so you might as well own it. And then you got your retirement. That's number, th you know, number, a big one on here. Um, retirement's definitely important. We got a plan for that. And then the one that is gets missed the most and that we're going to focus a lot on today is stocks and bonds, building wealth. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the personal family budget. We're going to send everybody on the call a copy of this form. There is a trick to filling it out properly. So what we're going to do, since we added Brian onto the call, I don't want to take a lot of time to go through this form today as far as filling it out, which I normally do. Uh, but I'm going to show you the form, and then what we're going to do is do a follow-up class that's specific to going through the form and just showing you how to fill it out and how to use it to your advantage. This form scares me because if it's off and I'm like, I'm losing money or I'm not saving money or whatever the case is, it gets me fired up. That's why you have to do this every single month. It's like a tool that drives me crazy, but it's also <laughs> built my wealth like crazy. It's an well. accountability tool, isn't it? It's a total accountability tool. And I've tried to do this form digitally on an Excel spreadsheet on my computer, and it does not work. So I would recommend, highly recommend, that everybody that does this, you print one out every month, right in the beginning of the month, you fill it out, you knock everything out with your, if you're a significant other or whatever, and then you have your, your month basically set. Super important, but you can see, it's gonna track every single bill you have. Anything you can think of that's an outgo, you pull up your credit card bills, you pull up your bank statements, your debit card, and you find out exactly where your money's going and you track every single piece of it on this form. You also track your income going in and then you find out how much money's left over. How much can you save? And then down at the bottom, you kind of um, summarize your assets and your net worth. And I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people on this call have a negative net worth and they're gonna be surprised that they have a negative <laughs> net worth. I see it all the time. I, 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 I do too. Mm -hmm. So this is a really important tool. Um, and I think once you get it and look it over, definitely start to think about how you can implement that and then look for the update on their second class to go through it and learn how to fill it out the proper way because it is very important that way. All right, secret of building savings. This is a key part, you guys. This was a mindset that I had to get into. If you want to build wealth, you gotta save first. And Brian alluded to that earlier on the 401k, right? You're paying yourself first. And I don't know if everyone was on the call, but can you explain that just real quick, what you were saying about that? If you actually think about it, when you're contributing to a 401k, you have your gross pay, and then what comes out? Social Security and Medicare tax. Then your 401k contribution goes in. Then federal tax comes out. And then what's left over? That's the money that goes in your bank to pay bills. So you just paid yourself first. And it's an amazing opportunity to build, build wealth through that. So you must save first, pay bills last. So a lot of people, obviously, they get their bills, they pay all their bills, and then after all their bills are paid, they have to spend money, and then they're like, oh, I've got 100 bucks left to save. Fantastic. Now, if you flip it around, and let's say you, you get a $1,000 paycheck that comes in, 20%, $200 immediately is gone. You can't spend $200 anymore. That's gone, it's in a savings account, it's out of sight, out of mind. It's an auto transfer, in my opinion, to a, an online bank account that you don't have access to right away. <laughs> uh, gone. Force yourself to live that way. And that was the toughest mindset for me to change, is like your bills are coming in, I gotta pay my bills, I gotta pay my bills as they come in. And then at the end, when you're done, you don't got any money left, it goes somewhere. I don't know where it goes, but it's just, a freaking process that I went through that I had no money. That's why I couldn't save. I had no idea where my money was going. So the first thing you gotta change is your mindset. First thing you do, save. Set aside 20% of your income. I'm not saying you can live off of this. I'm saying set it aside and start trying to live off of it. Because I'm telling you, as you start to see these things start to build up, it's gonna motivate you to save more. That's the key with this. That Greed form, sets in, I see it all the time. Exactly. It gets like an aggressive, you get aggressive on it. Like I got hyper aggressive. I like started, you know, my kids are like, Oh, can we go to here? And I'm like, no, I've, I've already saved that money. You're done. Go, go get a, you know, a carrot out of the fridge. You know, it's like, I'm not doing this. You I like saying it's not in the budget. 
It's not on exactly. the budget. That's right. And then, and John, we had a question. We had yeah. a question. Was that 20% pre-tax or after? I saw yeah. that pop up. That was from uh, Jim there. So, the, so great question. So when I made that example, that was a pre-tax 401k contribution. Now, I wasn't thinking we would get into, let's call it tax strategy today. So no. we might want to kick that all the way to the end. But in short, my example, it was pre-tax. Might not make sense to do that, and I'll leave it there. It might make sense to do it at, after tax. Well, and the 401k, too, is part of that 20%. I always include that in there. Um, I only contribute about 6% uh, monthly to my 401k. So my 20% is the 6% into my 401k plus another 12 or uh, what math? Does anyone have my calculator? 14. 14%. Jeez. <laughs> my other 14% is post tax. That's money that's deposited after my check comes in. Mm -hmm. So I'm saving 6% pre tax, which is great. I mean, I'm maxing that out. Uh, my 401k for sure. And then post tax, when I get paid, I'm taking the rest out of my net income and it's just gone. Like my check hits the bank account and I have auto transfers into a capital 360 account that is a high interest account, but it's my emergency account. But you mind if I comment on the 401k here, Jeff? Yeah, absolutely. I don't want to spend too much time here, but since we're already talking about it, here's the beauty of a 401k. And some of you've heard this when you came to the lunch and learns we did on the uh, real estate market. The 401k IRAs as well, when you contribute, you are contributing pre-tax dollars. So I'm getting a deduction on the front end. And this is before any match and this is before any return in the marketplace. Name another place where you actually get the deduction and you still have the dollar. Well, let's talk about mortgage interest. Mortgage interest, I spent a dollar and I might get back 25 cents of tax time if I don't get phased out by alternative minimum tax. So it's the only place where I get the deduction and I still have the dollar. That is a huge benefit. And again, that's before any compounding or employer match. So very, very, Absolutely. very powerful uh, savings tool. All right. And so here's another mindset for everybody. Pay once per month. You only, change, you only pay your bills once a month. When you do your personal family budget, you figure out how much you owe. You've got all your money piled in. You save your 20%. Then you pay all your bills and whatever's left over is what you get to live on. Mindset changer. And there is money left over. There always is. It's a matter of if you're in your head, your, your money is already spent. So that's why I say if you pay your bills first and then you try to save last, there's no money usually left because it's already spent in other places that you weren't figuring out. And that's when you start paying bills like, I got to pay a bill on the 5th, then I got to pay a bill on the 7th, I got to pay a bill on the 10th, I got to pay a bill on the 15th. Well, during those waiting times, you're spending other money that you should be saving. That's where people miss off on how to build wealth, is you're missing those opportunities to save money when you're spending it in between waiting for the next bill to come in. Because you don't want to put all the money in savings because you've got a bill coming in in 10 days or seven days or six days or whatever. Throughout each month, throughout each month, each month, save any checks and bills you receive at the first of the month. Deposit the checks, pay all your bills, allocate the rest of the money, and fill out your budget. I know this sounds like intriguing. Like, how the heck am I supposed to do that? It's actually not that difficult. Credit cards allow you to change your due dates. Um, your mortgage has a 15-day grace period on it, so you don't have to pay it until the, at, at the latest, the 16th of the month. There is ways to move your due dates. I have all of mine moved up to the first part of the month. You collect your bills from the last month. You get in, you get paid, and boom, you pay all your bills after you save 20%. It's uh, all about mindset, you guys. Hey, Should be mindset on the first, I'm rich. On the second, I'm poor, and I need to find new sources of income. Jeff, really quick, is there logic around the 20%? Or I guess some people are asking, why not 30? Why not 15? Where do you come up with 20% for savings? I mean, mine, I was saving up to 5% of my income at certain times. 20% is the minimum. You can save 30, 40, 50. Again, this is, a, this is gonna be a new concept for a lot of people and it's gonna take time to get used to it. If you start off to trying to save 30, like you set your goals too high, it's gonna fail. Start out at 20, and make that work. Once 20 works, and I'm telling you, you can make it work,
but you start to get more aggressive. Like I was talking on the last slide, you start to get more and more aggressive. You get, it, it becomes a game almost. Mm -hmm. So I'm all for saving more as long as you have the mindset to continue saving over and over. What I don't want to happen is save 30%, 30%, and then you run, you're running out of money and you have to go in and start taking money out of it back in. That's what you want to avoid. You want to get your budget set every month, 20%. You can well, save more at the end of the month, save more. And that's what's happened to me is I got my budget set. I was saving 20%, no problem. And because of my mindset change, I got so aggressive. I started saving more and more and more money. And it just built up to months where I was saving like half my net income, <laughs> literally. I, I actually Anything have on a, that, Brian? I have a, yeah, I do have one comment here. So you know, I go out and I, I teach class at Wazoo periodically, finance class, kind of fun. And one of the things I tell all the kids there is I said, listen, you can't count on social security. If it's there, great, but likely it's not going to be, there will be a fraction of what it is today, just because math says it will not be good in the future. Pensions are a thing of the past and inheritance is becoming scarcer and scarcer because people are living so much longer and 80% of our healthcare expenses occur in the last six months of life, i.e. where do you think that retirement or inheritance is likely being spent? Okay. And so you have to go into this basically assuming I'm not going to get social security. I'm not going to get a pension and I'm not likely going to receive inheritance. So if the old adage was for the people who were getting those things, like my parents' generation, save 10% of what you make, you need to double it if you're not going to be getting those sources. So that's really where I come up with the 20% number for, for these kids. So that means out of every $5 I make, $1 goes in savings. It's that simple. I love it. Perfect. So how do we get, one thing I mentioned, the first thing is we got, we can't carry credit card debt. Credit card debt has a high interest rate and it's near impossible to pay off if you're just sitting there paying the pay, uh, minimum payments. I mean, they're not amortized loans. They could take, you know, 20 years to pay off a credit card if you're just paying minimum payments. So the first step to building wealth is you've got to get out of the credit card usage. You've got, you cannot carry a balance on your credit cards. So the first goal that we have to work on using the personal family budget is we need to pay off our credit card debt aggressively. We need to pay off as fast as possible. Now, if you're starting this process with a personal family budget and you have credit card debt with a balance and you're not paying it off monthly, the only way to get aggressive and get out of credit card debt is to use an envelope system, cash only. And that's basically use your personal financial budget, break down where the spending goes, a lot, enough cash, and or you can use a debit card, but you cannot use a credit card. You can use your debit card, a lot enough cash to each of the categories on your list. And you can see the picture there, personal spending, gifts, shopping, food. Find out where the money's going, have a budget, have the cash allotted, and you cannot, absolutely cannot spend any more that's allotted to those categories. And that's why cash is, is even more important. Um, I never used cash before, I always used credit cards because I wanted the miles. And I had to stop using the credit card for the miles. I had to start using cash way more often. Now, I wasn't even carrying that credit card balance, but in order for me to get away from using credit cards, I started pay, uh, using cash more often. Changed my life again. I like, I didn't know what cash was for the longest time because every, all my cash was plastic and that was a big part of my problem. So envelope system, if you have a credit card, carry a balance, use the envelope system. Credit card system, if you pay your credit cards, you can use credit card and we'll get into that. Envelope system, if you're paying off credit card debt, once you have the bills to allocate the cash, I, I should have switched to the slide first, sorry guys. I forgot I have a slide on this. I know we cut this down a little bit. <laughs> Once the money's in a certain envelope, you can no longer purchase for that category until next month. If, for example, you run out of food money or gas money, obviously that's an important piece. You take it out of your entertainment budget. You take it out of your personal money. The bottom line is you can't spend any more than what's allotted to the different categories. So if you have to pull from one to satisfy another, that's fine, but you just can't start using a credit card again. That's the key. You've got to stay away from the credit card. I'm sure there's gonna be questions on that. Again, we'll get into more detail on this when we do the personal family budget. 
Uh, but the envelope system is very simple. Just use cash allotted, use the envelopes, put enough cash in for each category, and only spend what you have. I know it seems a little old school, like, ah, in the, you know, in the gig economy. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a great system. It has, you have to do it because no, you can't use a credit card to make it work. I mean, that's the problem is I was never able to make it, at least for me. I mean, you have to be super diligent and super dedicated in order to do it. And I just don't think most people have enough time in the day to do that. Um, envelope system, after all the bills are paid and the cash is allocated, you take the rest of the money and you pay down any revolving debt you have. Start with the smallest balance. Once the card is paid in full, move on to the next one. Small wins lead to big wins. That's so important, you guys. Get rid of all of them. I can't tell you how many clients I run into that have six, 10, 12 credit cards. And there are a lot of them are used like the Gap card or Kohl's card or, oh, I use this one because, or, or I use this one because I got a discount. It's like, you got a discount to pay them interest that's costing <laughs> you way more than that discount ever saved you. <laughs> yeah. you know, one of my, one of my uh, teachers in this class, one of my uh, coaches, he once told me, he's like, why are you still using your card? And I'm like, dude, I'm getting the air miles. You know, I get free tickets. And he's like, once you build wealth, you don't care about air miles. You care about, I'll just go buy a ticket if I need one because I got the money sitting right here. Air miles cost you money because you end up carrying a balance and you end up paying 10, 15, 20% interest. And then if you have a late payment, you're paying 25% interest plus late charges. You're, done, you're not winning using a credit card to get miles. There's a great saying, which is, those people who do not understand compound interest pay it. Those who do earn it. And you do wow. not want to be the first one. Love it. So again, once your cash is gone, cannot use credit cards for any expenses. So budget wisely, you got to keep that cash in the bank. I believe that this can be a really short term situation. If you do it properly, you'll be surprised at how aggressively you can pay down credit cards very, very quickly. The credit card system is max two credit cards, one for personal, one for business. More cards equals more debt. I can't tell you again how many people have multiple cards and they use them for specific instances, but that puts you in a position where you've got multiple different payments that you have to make and you're going to fall short. And then all of a sudden you're carrying a balance and paying 12, 15% interest on it. I don't even care how low the interest is. Even if it's at 6%, you're still losing money. You could mm -hmm. be saving and making more than that. That's right. So if you have a bunch of credit cards, cut them up. I wouldn't necessarily say close them all out because that might hurt your credit a little bit initially, but cut them up, do not use them. If it has an annual fee, close it. There's no point in paying any fees to credit cards. Yep. Uh, keep low limits to avoid excess spending. This was my favorite one. Matter of fact, I did this for my business card and Sky's probably disappointed in me for that as I put a, a lower limit than I wanted on that credit card for my business card because I want to control my spending in my business. I mean, I'm flowing this through from my personal life into my business life. It's so important for us to make sure that we're documenting this on every side. You know, if I had a $60,000 limit, I'm positive Sky would be out there at Amazon shopping for <laughs> like boom mics. I'm kidding. But seriously, <laughs> we don't need much more than a $1,000 limit, $2,000 limit, depending on what your spending are. Yeah, you might go on vacation, you need to rent a car, things like that. Yes, you need a credit card but you don't need a $30,000 limit for a credit card. That is an opportunity for disaster. Yeah. Um, every month, give yourself a $200 to $400 cash allowance and move this to your savings account. Purchase, make purchases under $20, use cash. Purchases above 20, go on the card. This was one of my favorite rules. And the reason is, think about how many times you go to Starbucks and throw your card and you don't think about it. Well, if you're using cash and you know you only have $200, you start thinking about going to Starbucks no longer. Yeah. I mean, I literally stopped going to Starbucks. I use Starbucks lightly. I mean, I, I was an addict for a long time. <laughs> um, my marketing team can attest to that. Um, I mean, I had massive bills. I was probably spending five, $600 a month. Now, not just on myself, but I took clients out and things like that. As I got more aggressive, I mean, I just stopped altogether. That's what the mindset does. When you start seeing your, your money grow, you change your habits. It's an amazing concept. 
So again, 200 to 400 cash allowance, depending on your, your, your lifestyle. And then just make sure you use cash. Purchase above $20 are for like groceries, gas, things like that. When you go out to lunch, you use cash. You go out to Starbucks, cash. It will change your life. Biggest challenge of the credit card system is not overspending. Once you use your allowance, you cannot use a credit card. You must pay your credit card every month. If you don't pay your credit card off, something happens and you fall behind and you have to make the minimum payment, you're back on the envelope system. And what's the saying again? Those people who don't understand compound interest pay it. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> this is what they want you to do. Right. Hey Jeff, really quick. And everybody, I'm seeing these questions and I know the slides, so I'm going to bring them up as they um, relate to the other content we have. So just really quick on the credit cards. He talked about like getting rid of them. However, if they want to buy another house or get another mortgage or something like that or refi, they need some of those accounts to stay open. So can you talk about closing down versus not closing down those lines of credit? I think you close down cards that charge you an annual fee, especially if you're not using them. You can leave credit cards open for a period of time. Closing out cards can affect your credit. It's your overall access to credit. So if you only have one credit card and it's a really small limit, and then you close out a bunch of other credit cards, lowering it even further, that can potentially hurt your credit. Now, the longer and longer you have the credit, the stronger and stronger your credit builds. I typically say you want no more than two, two accounts. Like when I'm helping people build credit, I think they need to get two credit cards, but that's it. You don't need four, six or whatever. So right. if you're an individual and you've got four cards, you could drop down to two, but that second one, I wouldn't use at all. I'd keep it open as long as it doesn't have an annual fee. And then the other ones, again, you could keep them open unless they have an annual fee. The annual fee it's is just paying the bank money for no reason. Keeping the one with the longest history. Yeah, keep the one with the longest history. Okay. And we could talk to more detail on that. I mean, that, that is a good question on the credit. But again, I have two credit cards on my credit, and I've got amazing credit. I'm like an 850 plus or 840 or whatever. I'm at the top line. At least that's what Bank of America tells me. Yeah. And I have no car loans, and I have a mortgage. That's it. But it's because of my length of history I mean, one of my credit cards is, um, is probably like 15 or 16 years old, you know? So that length of history is why my credit scores are so good. And of course, no late payments, blah, blah, blah. So anyone that has credit cards with a really short history, they should probably hang on to one or two at least. And then after time, their credit scores will continue to grow. Uh, what about points and miles? We talked about that, but I want to reiterate it. There is no point to point miles other than paying interest to the bank and giving them the benefit because you're paying an annual fee. Again, that takes away from your income. And then if you're paying a balance on it, you're paying rates, uh, interest on it as well, the compound thing again. So yes, you can get a credit card that pays points or miles oh, as long as you're not paying an annual fee, if you can find one, and as long as you're using it and paying it off every month. So now that you paid off your credit cards, optimize your budget, step three, survival account. This is probably one of the most important things. I don't see a lot of people with savings accounts anymore, unfortunately. Money's in their bank, sitting there doing nothing, and they have no reserve account. Um, it's equal to three to six months of monthly expenses. I'm in the mortgage business, so I carry about 12 right now. <laughs> Never knowing what's going to happen when you're on commission and everything else. So I carry a much higher one. What are your thoughts on that, Brian? I completely agree. In fact, I usually say it's three to six months at least if you're self-employed. You know, definitely extend that even further. If you live in a commission world even further, they say for me, for example, I should have three months worth of expenses in savings. Now, this was one of the last slides of my presentation. Let's just do it now. I'm not leaving that money sitting in savings polishing the bank's floors. It's not happening. So what I have is I have a immediate reserve, I have an extended reserve, and then I have my emergencies and opportunities fund. In other words, I've got savings, I've got an online high yield savings like you talked about, your orange account, and then I've, or your 360 account, and then I have a, an investment account that is not a retirement account, money I can get to if I have to before the age of 59 and a half without any penalties. So we can get into that a little bit later, but yeah, I, I've, 
I really like to make sure I have enough reserve. And I think this whole COVID-19 thing really brought people up short. The average yep. American cannot afford a $400 emergency. My kids can afford a $400 emergency. This is ridiculous. <laughs> but we all have a tendency to do what? We, we lease cars that, because we can't afford to buy them. We lease our phone because we really can't afford to spend $1,000 on the latest and greatest iPhone. I have a, what? My model of my phone is four models behind. I practically have to kickstart it in the morning. It's so old. And I am proud of it. Okay? We all have got to get over this thing of keeping up with the Joneses. So true. So. And, the, and the key with the savings account, and I love that you brought that up, Brian, is just having, you got to have the emergency fund, but you want to get it out of sight, out of mind. So I That's feel right. like you got to have a separate account. I have the 360 online account through Capital One. I bank with Bank of America. Every month I have money that goes out of my account automatically. On the day after I get paid, boom, money's gone. That 20% that we we're talking about, it goes into that online account. And then as that account builds up to the three, six, 12 months or whatever you're holding, I start sweeping money away into an investment account like you were mentioning that's a little more aggressive on the returns and stocks and bonds and things like that because right. I don't want to just get I mean, that Capital One account is like one and a half percent, which I think is pretty good for a savings account. But, you know, stocks, bonds, everything like that's going to return to much higher routes because I want to keep my money working at different levels. So that's you right. get higher and higher on the on the return. So I use it as a transfer account. And then as money builds up, you transfer money into other investments. So, Sky, do you want to answer that question right now that just popped up? Um, yeah. So, well, we had two. One was, does investing in other things count as savings? And as far as that goes, it, it doesn't for the emergency fund because that wouldn't be liquid, but it does, anything over that would. Yeah, so let me, um, and then let me we just, have another one. Yeah. I, I saw their questions. Let me just throw it in there. So, I have my checking and then I have my attached savings. And then, like Jeff was talking about, you have some sort of like a, I call it an online high-yield savings account. Capital One's 360 account is a great example. It's online, and what happens is you go and you set that account up, and then they say, hey, do you want to connect this up with a bank account? And you, you do, and you connect that to your checking account. You have to put in your routing and, and everything. And then, so that's one step removed. And then in addition to that, because I don't, I don't want to have a bunch of money earning 1.5% forever, right? Taxes yeah. and inflation after that, I am going to lose money, but it's better than leave it in the savings account at Bank of America or wherever you're at, and you're getting what? 0.01% or some crazy, ridiculous amount these days. Anyway, that's a whole other side story. So then I set myself up. My wife and I have a joint investment account. And this is the answer to the question someone had. Well, I just have IRAs. What do you mean by another type of an investment account? So there's all these different tax umbrellas. So when you hear the term 401k, Roth IRA, um, IRA, all that, that's, a, that's an umbrella that, that tells, talks about how that money is taxed. It doesn't say anything about what's actually in that account. I can have investments in all those types of accounts. So we're talking about here, as you've probably heard the term brokerage account, individual account, joint account, trust account, whatever it may be. This is after tax money that goes in just like in savings, but instead of it sitting in cash earning almost nothing, it's invested in stocks and bonds or a combination thereof, and it has a shot of actually earning something. So I call this the emergencies and opportunities fund. So this is my, you know, let's just call it my deep cash. I hope I don't have to get to this money. But if I have to, that money is three to four days away at most. And there's no penalties for getting out. Perfect. We good there, Sky? Okay. So retirement, we already kind of touched on this multiple times. I always try to max out your 401k. Make sure at least you're getting the employer match. I mean, if your employer is matching up to 6% of your investment at 50% of the, your total investment, I mean, max it out at least at 6%, uh, but continue to make sure that you try and max out your 401k by the time the end of the year comes by. What's the maximum amount you can put in the 401k right now, Brian? Uh, it's 19,500, and that can go to pre-tax or Roth or combination thereof if you're under 50. You're 50 plus, meaning you're 50 plus by end of year, okay? So if I'm not 50 now, but I'm 50 on December 31st, I get to put an additional six grand in there. Or let's see, $6,500 in there, excuse me, because it's $26,000 uh, for 50 plus. It's a significant amount of money that you can contribute. I qualify, I'm in. Hey, congratulations. Yes. 
I did my part last year for sure. And I'm doing it this year for sure. There's no doubt. Amazing. Even when the market returns zero, you still make a 15 to 20% return on your money because of the, you're not paying the taxes on it. It comes right out of your check. Like we, like Brian was saying earlier, you're paying yourself first. So you're not getting locked for uh, federal taxes out of there. So when the money goes in, even if it just sits there, you're making money. Not sure if you agree with that or not, or not, Brian, but what are your thoughts on that? On the no Roth piece? Oh, no, the, even when the market returns zero. Well, yeah, absolutely. If I'm in a 25% marginal tax bracket and I put a dollar in there, I have the dollar and I save 25 cents on that because had I taken that in paycheck, I would have 75 cents, right? Yep. Yep. Makes sense. Absolutely. So IRAs, if no 401k, if you have the ability to contribute, contribute to an IRA on top of your 401k, um, no Roth IRAs. I mean, the reasoning behind that is you're paying taxes up front on the money and then putting it into an investment vehicle that does grow over time tax free, but you're missing out on that 20 to 25% that you lost when you got paid on it. Any yeah. feedback on that, Brian? So, you know, the answer, you know, the old adage, it depends. So let's say that I'm young. I'm not in my peak income earning years. You know, let's say I'm 25. Well, I can't touch this money until let's just use round number 60. I don't know about you, the fact that the government is gonna borrow five trillion additional dollars just this year to bail us out from COVID-19 alone, they're gonna to have to raise taxes in the future. So when I'm young, I'm not in my peak income earning years, therefore I'm not in a very high tax bracket. Maybe I'm better off to get, to, to, to forego the deduction in lieu of getting tax-free growth because in the future when I need this money, tax rates are likely gonna be higher because where does the government get its money? through taxes and weapon sales, but they don't like to talk about weapon sales. So it's going to be taxes, right? So they're going to need, they're going to need that tax revenue in the future. So if I can save today at a lower rate and spend it in the future when tax rates are much higher, that spreads in my favor. The old, the rule of thumb is you got to have at least seven years to see the benefits of tax-free growth versus getting a tax deduction today for a standard middle-class person in a 22 to 24% marginal tax bracket. That's good information. We'll have to update that to, it depends. I like it. It always depends. Yeah. I'm hey sure Jeff, it does. yeah. If you're maxing out your 401k, but you have other debt, like say you have, you're putting 15% into retirement, but like you have a, an auto loan or student loans or credit card debt, do you recommend keeping that maxed out or would you lower it to get rid of some of the debt first? I, I would say it depends as well. I mean, if it has an employer match, I think I would be putting the money in and up to the employer match to get the free money um, and then focus in on paying off the debt. Um, if there's no employer match, I'd leave that to Brian. Brian, what are your thoughts? Well, it comes down to, you know, again, if you're a peak, if you're making a lot of money and Uncle Sam's a huge participant at tax time, let's just say, you know, you're in a, what, 30, let me look here, let's say you're in a 32% marginal tax bracket. Every dollar you put in your 401k saves you 32 cents. That's huge. And that's before employer match or anything. And you have an auto loan like me at 2.9%. That pencils all day long. Yeah. But if I'm not disciplined and I'm also racking up credit card debt and other things, then I probably need to say, you know what? I'm going to self check myself here a little bit like an alcoholic. I can't control myself. I got to stop pigging out on all the debt. I just got to pay this debt off despite the numbers and then just focus on saving. So it just depends so I think on, it on sounds who you like, are. You know, get, the, get the 401k auto withdrawal going on your, on your paycheck so you don't That's see true. that money up front. Absolutely. But if you start to struggle with getting the credit cards paid off and you keep going mm -hmm. backwards or whatever, mm -hmm. then it might make sense to pull out of that a little more to have a little more cash flow to help you. But again, it's comes down. I think the discipline part of what you said, Brian, is more important than anything. Yeah. If you're struggling because you're not following a plan, yeah. then pulling more money out of your 401k and not investing in it is not going to help you. Mm -hmm. If you're following mm -hmm. the plan hardcore and you're hitting it hard and everything's going the way it's supposed to, yeah. and you still can't get any, uh, you know, make any progress, then yeah, maybe pull back out of the 401k. But I think it's, it's a bigger, it's probably a, a, if you're not investing, if you are investing in the 401k and you're still having issues, more than likely it's because you're not following a plan. Yeah. And the other part is you have to ultimately ask yourself why are you even having this problem in the first place? And as uh, Morgan here in our office likes to say, you know, am I spending money to impress people that I don't like? Am I spending money I don't have to impress people I don't like? <laughs> and ultimately, there's a yeah. lot of that, right? This is like personal development as well. Yeah. Right? <laughs>
So all right, we gotta move on because we are we're probably gonna go a little great over conversation. as is. But um, for some of these more specific questions, Brian and Jeff are both available. So absolutely um, and we can bring up stuff at the end, but we want to respect everybody's time. So Okay, so last quote, seventy eight percent of Americans are concerned they don't qualify, they haven't or don't have enough money to retire. That's kind of a scary thought. Oh, it's absolutely the case. Real estate, you need a place to live. Might as well build wealth for yourself instead of someone else. Real estate allows you to build wealth in two ways. Every time you make a payment, the balance goes down. Meanwhile, value increases. Again, it's another reason never to prepay your mortgage until the age of 50 because that's an asset that you leverage that grows in two ways. I mean, there's no point in paying extra to your mortgage. Take that money, pay off debt. Take that money and invest to build more wealth. The power of leverage. Stocks and bonds, I think this is the biggest question I get. Like I'm saying, hey, you know, don't prepay your mortgage, fix some of that money in savings and go buy some stocks and bonds and, and your growth is gonna be, you know, it's gonna go way up. I mean, it's exponential growth in stocks and bonds versus a savings account or otherwise. And the biggest question is like, where do I start? You know, how do I do that? What stocks should I buy? Mm -hmm. And that's why we brought Brian on really. I mean, is give guys, give people, our clients here clarity on, what this looks like, it's not as difficult as it sounds. Uh, most Americans have no money invested outside of a retirement account savings or savings. Highest return of any of the wealth building pillars. The current average annual return on, from 1923, the year of the S&P's inception through 2016 is 12.25%. The Per year market. compounded. Yeah. <laughs> Big. Think about that. I, I would love to see, you know, $100 invested at 1923 and what it would be worth in 2016 after that kind of average growth. Oh, it's huge. Um, if you want to retire early, this is the only way. Most people just don't know where to start. That's and right. That's why I think a lot of you are on this call. All right, Beautiful. everybody. Awesome. All right. Let me, uh, let me steal the screen share now. And as we switch over, if anyone has to jump off since we're going over on time, this is being recorded. So if you have to go, no worries. We'll send out the recording to everybody so you can jump in. Or, or you might even want to go back through and watch it a couple times and really let everything soak in. So, Great. Well, thank you, Jeff. You so uh, here's, our, here's our smiling faces. So we're Comprehensive Wealth Management. Jeff, again, comprehensive, <laughs> not common wealth management. Come on, man. It's so funny. Everyone says Commonwealth Wealth Management. It's so funny. I so, think I've struggled with that for like the last 10 everyone years. Everyone does. My parents do. My parents way. do. So I'm actually right over here in the other tower from Jeff. So he's sitting in his, uh, actually you're sitting in Woodenville right now. Sky and Jay are actually over in the 3400 tower. I'm in the 3500 tower. So if you walk, you know where Jeff's office is. You veer right, you go into the 3500 tower right here on the ground floor. So, all right. So you guys all know who I'm, uh, who I am. So I'm one of the lead, I'm the lead advisor here at Comprehensive Wealth Management, one of the owners. Or believe it or not, Jeff, I'm almost been doing this 20 years now, which is blowing my mind. So you still look like a young pup too. Well, How do you do I'll that? tell you, I just crossed. I, I had my birthday was uh, on June 15th. I turned 42, and I was on that day. I was like 21 years ago today. I went on my 21 run. That is that is blowing my mind. Cause didn't it take forever to get to 21? So okay. So to kind of continue on, I want to talk about stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and exchange traded funds. I want to talk about this concept of compound interest some more, not just from a credit card standpoint, this concept of dollar cost averaging, and then really building your foundation. You already talked a lot about that, Jeff, but then also let's talk about, well, how do we actually get started? How do we get this train moving? So kind of elementary class, I don't know how many people here took a finance class in college, but this is a very, very classic one that they talk about. So a stock is ownership, right? And it's said that you want to own stocks, you want to own as many as you can and as early as possible. That will increase your return over time, at least based on history. I can't make any promises. Whereas bonds are loanership. You're lending money to the company as opposed, as opposed to being a shareholder. And in return, you're getting interest. Now, bonds do have their place, but if you're just starting out, you definitely want to focus more on stocks than bonds. So then there's this concept uh, called a mutual fund, which used to be considered the poor person's way of investing. And it was, it used to be very expensive to go and buy all the individual stocks that you might want to have in a diversified portfolio. So you could just go to a mutual fund and invest in a mutual fund. And, you know, you've got a fund manager who is picking and choosing which stocks to invest in. Now, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on mutual funds, but it's a very, very common way to invest. And it's pretty much what you're going to find in a 401k these days. Most people here who have money in a 401k likely have money 
the mutual fund. By the way, Sky, how are we doing on time? What's our, what's our cutoff here? We are just going over at this point. <laughs> we're going over at this point. All right, we're just getting started yet. with mine. I'll, I'll make it quick. There's, not a, there's a lot of overlap here based on what we just went through. But there's this new thing here called an exchange traded fund, which is really a marriage between a stock and a mutual fund. So a stock trades on an exchange, whereas most people don't know this, a mutual fund, you're actually purchasing and redeeming from the mutual fund company. So if I were to you know, go and buy an American fund or a Vanguard fund, I'm actually buying it and selling it from them. This is why you get end of day pricing. But now there's this thing in the middle, this hybrid called an exchange traded fund or ETF, which is really a mutual fund and that it's a pooling of stocks or bonds or a combination thereof, but it trades on an exchange, hence the name exchange traded fund. And the advantage there is, is that I get real time pricing. Now, there are no absolutes. It's not all about stocks and it's not all about mutual funds or exchange traded funds. Right now, everyone is enamored with exchange traded funds. They're just an index. They do have their problems too. And I'm just going to point out if people really like to get into these exchange traded funds, be careful because they are not created equal. And you also have to be careful because if you start getting into like commodities like oil and so forth, you actually start seeing some real funky pricing issues that can happen. I don't know if you guys remember when oil went to negative oil prices for a little bit, that completely just blew apart the exchange traded funds with respect to oil for a little bit. So just a heads up on that. Jeff, were you going to say something? I was wondering about the ETFs though. Like what if you just mm -hmm. invested in like a, something that tracked the S&P 500 or something like that? Perfect I mean example of that. So I go buy an S&P 500 index mutual fund, like the Vanguard 500 fund, but I'm going to get end of day pricing there. So if I okay. purchase and redeem from Vanguard, I'm getting end of day. Or I can also go buy the Vanguard ETF or the iShares ETF, and I'm going to get real time pricing. And a good example earlier this year when the market was in its absolute meltdown, I probably wanted to have an ETF so I could bail midday because we had a market that would start off down 2% and all of a sudden it would run and be down 10% at close. Well, if I had a mutual fund, congratulations, you got end of day pricing. If I had an exchange traded fund, I get real time pricing. I lock my price right then and there. Got it. So there are definitely some advantages. You just got to understand how all of these tools work. There are great mutual funds out there. Sometimes you want an active manager, someone who really understands. I think a really good example of that is emerging markets. Emerging markets, we've got foreign currency risk. We've got political risk, right? So you got to really have to understand how that market works. So going and buying an index where there literally is no one behind the wheel, just a mathematical formula picking which stocks go in here. Maybe you want a little more thought in that process. Really good example of when you might want a mutual fund as opposed to an exchange traded fund. Okay. If I'm buying large cap, meaning big companies here in the United States, not really a lot of those. Might be better off to go buy an exchange traded fund in that case, because most of the time the index, which I can buy in an ETF form will outperform the mutual fund manager. So, so Jeff asked me to kind of show the difference between what your total return is if you put money in savings versus bonds versus stocks over time. So I grabbed a very, very classic chart here. This is known as the Ibbotson chart. They put it out every year. If you want to look that up, it's I-B-B-O-T-S-O-N. Just Google that. You'll see this. The latest one they have is through 2018, but you get the idea. If I were to invest in treasury bills long-term, which by the way, no one does in the long-term. It's a short-term play usually. Treasury bills are really, really, really short-term government bonds, you know, government borrowing money. From 1926 through the end of 2018, I would have earned a whopping 3.3% per year on average, which would have turned out to be $21 in the end, which seems pretty good. But when we look at public enemy number one, that being inflation, and we take off 2.9%, what's our return? 0.4%. But we have to pay taxes on the 3.3% too, don't we? And depending on our tax bracket, we're likely not making any money, actually losing money when we take off taxes and inflation, which really leads to the question, why do we invest? Most people say, oh, it's because we want, you know, I want to make money, which is true, but we actually invest to stay ahead of taxes and inflation. So whenever you're looking at your return, one of the things you have to consider is, if I made 10% this year and inflation was 9%, I didn't really have that good a year. I only made 1% and I get to pay taxes on the 10%. So you need to look at what's called your real return. That's a teachable moment, guys. I want to write that one down, your real return. Your return 
over and above inflation. Okay, inflation is the silent killer of financial plans. You have to pay attention to it. I'm gonna skip right by government bonds. It's much like treasury bills, you can see 5.5% and let's get into stocks. So you probably heard the term large cap stocks. Those are just large companies basically. If you put a dollar in the market in 1926 and just held onto it no matter what and reinvested your dividends along the way as they came in, you would have actually made exactly 10% per year on average. That $1 would be worth $7,000 today. Phenomenal. Now, most of us don't have 92 years, which is what we're looking at here, but you get the idea. You definitely want to own stocks versus bonds in the long run. And that's really what Jeff was talking about earlier. Yes, build our savings. Build our deep reserve, as I was talking about earlier. But you've got to venture out. You've got to build an investment portfolio. So make sure that you can actually retire someday. You have to stay ahead of taxes and inflation. And then small, small cap stocks. So these are the smaller companies that ultimately, if they're successful, become large cap companies, right? Microsoft was a small cap, was small stock once upon a time and became a large stock. It averaged 11.8% over that same time period. Look at the difference in the amount of money you have. It's almost five times as much. But you only made what? Not even, what, 18% more in total return on average, but you have almost five times as much money. So one, the sooner you start and the longer you invest, the more you will likely make in total return per year on average. Something to keep in mind. One of the reasons that Warren Buffett is so successful is that he has been investing for a really long time. He bought his first shares of Coca-Cola stock when he was 11, supposedly. The guy's like 90 years old now. I mean, he's almost living this chart. He's like 80, he's been compounding for like 80 years. Think about that, it's unbelievable. And he's been compounding north of 20% per year last time I looked. An unbelievable return. The sooner you start, the better your odds of making money and the higher your odds of having a higher average rate of return over time. So there's this concept called dollar cost averaging. And a lot of people do it and aren't even aware of it, which is you're putting money in your 401k every single month. So let's just say I'm putting money every single month into mutual fund X, making up a name. And one, you know, I buy it at $10 the first time and then it goes up to $14. You know, I, I still put the same thousand bucks in. Well, I'm buying fewer shares at a higher price in this example, aren't I? But then it drops down to $9 and I still put my thousand dollars in. Now I'm buying more shares at a lower price. And what you'll see over time in this very simplistic example here is, is that it results in a lower average cost per share than if I were to do a lump sum investment, in this case, $8,000. If I initially invested $8,000 at $10, my average price is $10, it's not rocket science, but if I'm buying in all these little dips along the way, my average price ends up being $9.61, I actually have a little bit of a return. The reason I bring this up is, is that people have a tendency to say, yeah, I don't think it's a good time to invest in the market. That's a little bit like having kids. There is no good time. Just get it, just start, just do it, okay? <laughs> I remember when we were talking about having kids, somebody said, just, just have kids, just get it over with. There is no good time. So, and they were right. So get started. If you're just starting out and you're putting money in every single month and the market goes down, buy more. That's your opportunity to buy more. Like Jeff was talking about, he's really hitting this hard. The market goes down. That's an opportunity to buy more shares at a lower price. I don't know about you, but I think the United States isn't going away. I don't think the stock market's going away anytime soon. And so unless you think it's going away, when the market goes down, buy more shares. So the power of compound interest, and we call this the 20 mile march. This is that systematic discipline I was telling you about. I remember my, my friend, the, 77 year old retired kindergarten teacher whose wife is a, a school librarian. This is him right here. You're starting out, you don't have a lot of money and you're just slowly, you just keep putting money away. You have faith. You believe that in the long run, this is going to work. And based on history, it works. Based on lots of history, it works. But it's a little bit like your snowball. You start doing the little snowman, it takes forever to get that snowman started. But then as a the snowman gets larger, each revolution, it gets so much bigger, so much faster, right? It's the same idea here. The compounding of interest is what happens is, is this compounding on compounding, on compounding on compounding. You know, 
It was Albert Einstein who said, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. And as I said earlier, those who don't understand it, pay it. Those that do understand it, earn it. We want to be in the second camp. Einstein was a pretty smart guy. We call this the 20 mile march because you'll notice here that 20, 20 years is when you start to really see the benefits of compounding. Early on, it's kind of discouraging to be honest. You're not really seeing much happen, but you got to stick with it. So we like to say build your foundation or your foundation of safety first. Budget, have one. Warren, if you ask Warren Buffett, what's the number one investment you can make? Have a budget, it will be his response. I think that's pretty interesting. There's actually a story where he was uh, having it, I think it was back in 2010, it was a uh, college reunion and his roommates were just hounding him, Warren, you gotta put money in, we're buying this couch. He says, it's not in the budget. And he, they wanted him to put 500 bucks and they were gonna do this big, you know, lavish thing, you know, he went to an Ivy League school and so forth. And he was gonna remind all his buddies at the reunion what that $500 amounted to today, which was about $50,000. It's not in the budget, it matters. Those little nickels and dimes, those transactions over twenty dollars that you put on, or under twenty dollars that you put on the credit card, those add up. That's exactly what he's talking about. Pay yourself first. Talked about it earlier. Four hundred one k is a really good way to do that, but you also have to set it up where you have systematic discipline to other types of accounts eventually as well. Reserves: three to six months worth of expenses in savings. Well, you don't know what your expenses are until you have a budget. So, like I said earlier. I have my revolving checking. I have my savings, which is just attached to it. That's only one month's worth of expenses in savings. Then I have my once removed savings, deep savings, which is that online high yield savings account that's connected up, but it's one step removed. And then I have my other investment account, which I talk about here, the Emergencies and Opportunities Fund. This is money that's invested in a diversified portfolio. Now I'm not taking as much risk here because it's money I might need before retirement. So it's, you know, it's, let's say medium term money. So it's a little bit more conservative than my retirement accounts because I don't have as much time potentially here when I'm going to need it. For example, my wife and I, we bought a house uh, a little over five years ago. We need to make a down payment on it, freed up the cash, took it's what's called T plus three, trade day plus three days. The money settles on the fourth day. It was in my bank account. Cost me zero to trade, cost me zero to transfer. There were no penalties for doing so. But meanwhile, that money was invested in earning money until then. So that's a good example of an emergencies and opportunities fund use. And the last piece here is participate in your 401k. When you're first starting out and you're building all of these things, we recommend go get the free money. Do the minimum to get the maximum match to start with. A lot of a very popular match structure is, is we'll match you 50% on the first 6% you contribute. Guess how much I'm going to recommend you contribute? 6% until you have your budget, until you have your three to six months worth of expenses, maybe even a year, depending on, on your circumstances, in reserve. Then we're gonna start building that emergencies and opportunities fund. Then we're gonna start increasing 401k contributions. Now, whether that 401k contribution goes to the deductible side or to the Roth side where you never pay tax again, that is completely situational depending on you. If you're in a really high tax bracket, yeah, probably go get that deduction. If you're young, you're not in your peak income earning years, you got a really long time to see the benefits of tax-free growth that you'll never pay money on in your lifetime, your spouse's lifetime if you're married, or even your kid's lifetime, might make sense to get some tax-free money instead. So that's a whole nother conversation. And so this is sort of to wrap a bow around it. There are lots of different ways you can get started. Now, Robin, the Robin Hood app has been making a lot of news lately. I don't know if you saw that. Little, little fun sidebar economic story or a news story. Uh, you guys have probably all heard of the Hertz rental car store or um, company. They're in bankruptcy, but all of a sudden, while in bankruptcy proceedings, the Hertz stock, which is publicly traded, went up 800%. And it turned out that if you actually went and looked at who was buying it, it was all these, I'm gonna call it college kids and right out of college kids, because you can go download this, this investing app called Robinhood, and it allows you to trade stock, buy and sell stocks for free. Now understand there ain't no free lunch. They're actually charging you a higher share price. You just don't have a ticket charge per transaction. And they were buying up a lot of Hertz stock. So Hertz then asked the bankruptcy court, hey, uh, do you think we could do a, a stock offering right now? 
bankruptcy court gave them permission to do up to $1 billion in, in stock sale. Now, the SEC eventually came in and said, no, you're not doing that. No, 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 no. Not while in bankruptcy. That's crazy. But they were calling it the first IBO, initial bankruptcy offering. Anyway, just a kind of a fun sidebar story you know, for, for the recording, if you will. But there are lots of good programs out there. There's Wealthfront, or I think it's Wealthfront, out, out of Silicon Valley. We have our own program here. I'll give you our plug, which is called Starting Strong. And it's actually, you actually get to sit down with, uh, in this particular case, uh, Mark Knauss, he's on the right there. He's the one that pioneered this whole program for our firm. This is a program geared around people who are saying, hey, I need to get started. I make decent money. I need to start putting it away, but I don't know where to put it. I don't know if should it go into my 401k, a Roth IRA, this emergencies and opportunities fund, but we also help you along the way with what we call milestones, hitting that three to six month reserve, saving for that house if that's, if that's a goal, helping you pay down that debt. So if you guys have ever been through the Dave Ramsey course or what Jeff's doing here, it's very similar to that, but then we're putting our investment platform on top of that as well. So if that is of interest to you guys, We'd love to talk to you. You can get a hold of me here. I'm sure you guys all have email these days. You can email me there, Brian L at CWMNW, or you can email Mark directly. He's the one that runs that Starting Strong program. And we can actually do those meetings via Zoom just like this. And with that, it's q and I know we're over time. I saw quite a few questions come up in the q and I don't know, Sky, if you, uh, if you wanna stick, um, go and hit a few of those questions, or if we wanna get into some of the economic stuff right now. What do we wanna do here? Let's do a couple of questions and then if anyone has one that's not in the chat, that's fine too. Okay. Um, so going back to, we have a lot of questions on retirement. We might want to do like a whole class just on this. It's a, it's um, a whole class in itself. We've got it absolutely some, is. some self-employed people. So one, do you have recommendations of where they would open up a 401k as a self-employed person? And then one guy over 50, also self-employed. He has a Roth IRA. He's asking, do I get out of that? No, and so, so I saw that question come up. Let's tackle that second one first with the Roth IRA. The answer would be no. One, if you get out of it, you're gonna end up paying taxes and a 10% penalty on any growth in that account because you're under the age of 59 and a half. And or you might have not have had that account for five years. There's a, a, a two stipulations there with respect to the Roth IRA. I would say that you know the horse is out of the barn on that one. Go ahead and leave it where it's at. The real question is, is where should you put future contributions? Should you put those in the Roth? Or should you put those in an IRA? If you're self-employed, should that be into maybe a SEP IRA or this thing called an individual 401k if it's just you? Uh, those are all questions that I really can't answer in this forum necessarily because it's very specific. But uh, I would leave the Roth IRA where it's at for the time being. Uh, with respect to the other account uh, or the other question, which was uh, they're self-employed and, and should they set up a 401k? It depends. You. 401ks are amazing because you don't really have to earn very much to be able to put away a lot, okay? So the contribution rule is, is I can put away 100% of my pay up to the 401k limit. So if I'm paying myself 30 grand a year in salary as a self-employed person and I'm 50 plus, I can put away 26,000 of that $30,000 into my 401k on a pre-tax basis. If I had a SEP IRA, the math's a lot different. I can only put away 25% of that $30,000 salary. So it's not near as significant. What is that, a little over seven grand? So it really depends on your circumstances, whether or not you wanna go incur the expense of setting up that 401k. So if you wanna chat about that more, I'm happy, because sometimes a SEP IRA, which doesn't have any administrative expenses associated with it, makes more sense. Just depends on your circumstances. Um, okay, we didn't talk about student loans really uh, at all. Okay. First of all, I guess either of you, where does that fit into the steps? Is that something that you look at trying to pay them down? Do you let them roll? And then do you have suggestions on how to get those suckers out of your life? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I wrote asking a whole, for myself done, and for the friend that asked. <laughs> I've done several articles on, on you know, case studies for the Seattle Times, being a certified financial planner, and student loans has been at the heart of a lot of those. Uh, there are actually a lot of student loan assistance programs, like there's one called PAY, P-A-Y-E, which is uh, pay as you earn, I believe is what the, ac yeah, that's what the acronym stands for. So basically what this is, is it's an income-based repayment plan. And so 
you know, you actually kind of submit your financials, if you will, and say, based on my income and expenses, here's how much I can actually, and then they have a formula that says, all right, well, of that, here's how much you have to pay. Now, the beauty of it, if you're the loan holder, if you're the taxpayer who's supporting this, you're not saying this is beautiful, but from the loan holder standpoint, at the end of 20 years, whatever loans remain are forgiven. At least last time I looked at that program, which was what, a couple years ago. And a good example, my, my wife has been going to physical therapy for some back issues and her physical therapist, she changed tracks so many times throughout school that she graduated with over $400,000 in student loans. Jeez. And she ended up with a physical therapy degree. The, obviously the, the, the income does not meet the loan, right? You probably wouldn't lend her money, right, Jeff? That's, that's pretty bad. Physical Sounds therapists horrible. don't make very much money. So she's in this pay as you earn program, thank goodness, because she's making the reasonable payment that they require based on her income and loan balance. And at the end of 20 years, whatever's remaining will be forgiven. So that's step number one is see whether or not that applies to you, whether or not you fit that. If it does, terrific. If it doesn't, I don't know what your philosophy is, Jeff, but it just really depends on the rate. One thing about student loans is they are deductible but you can have a phase out because of alternative minimum tax, which I will submit that if you have student loans and you are subject to alternative minimum tax, you're a high income earner, pay them off. <laughs> if you're not a high income earner, not subject to alternative minimum tax and the rate and the rates are real favorable, you know, real low, what I would rather see you do is keep paying on those, keep deducting that interest at tax time, but continue to build that foundation of safety. Get that three to, months, three to six months worth of expenses in reserve, right? One thing we didn't talk about was lovely insurance. You want to make sure that if something happens and you can't work or something happens to you and you pass away, God forbid, you don't leave the wife and kids, if that's the case, or, or husband and kids in a lurch. So that's something else you got to think about too, but I didn't want to get into that today. So the student loan that's question is really, subject, really big. I mean, a lot of people don't have insurance, you know, and that is very important. And what do you recommend on insurance? Do you normally go term or do you go whole life? Or uh, You know, I'm a big fan of term insurance. It's really, it's really inexpensive. My general rule of thumb on how much you need is six times earnings plus mortgage. That's where I start. And then you can start whittling that number down. You know, you could say six times earnings plus mortgage minus portfolio. But if you're under 59 and a half, what part of my portfolio do I consider? Well, I'm not going to consider my 401k, right? So it's going to be only the money that's in the bank, my emergencies, opportunities, fund, things like that. So, so I think maybe guys, what we probably need to look at is, is a retirement. One of these, you know, saving for retirement, where do I put my money? Do I put it in an IRA, 401k, Roth IRA, how much, you know, that, that kind of stuff sounds like it might be a, another good leg of this particular piece. I agree. This okay. is an iceberg. We're, we're looking at the little piece you see above the water. <laughs> Big time. Yeah, the recommendation on like car loans and student loans, at least from my, the concepts that I've been taught and, and um, that we're talking about earlier today was, you know, try to be aggressive on the payoff, but it's after the 20%. Yeah. Save the you, 20%. Credit cards are first. Then you start saving the 20 or, the, or you, you got to get the 20% in and then get aggressive with leftover yeah. money on top of that. Before you go to like 30 or 40 or 50% savings, yeah. get aggressive and pay off car loans and student loans as fast as you can. And those are installment loans. So those are different. I mean, credit cards are, they never charge you like a full installment payment. You know, you're paying a ton of interest on those and it's typically a lot higher. And yeah. like Brian alluded to, too, it's, it depends on the rate. I mean, if you have a student loan at 7%, yeah, you want to start knocking that thing out as fast as, you can, as possible because that's huge. But if you can refinance it right now, I've seen some of those lower rates out there. I mean, if you can get it down to you know, 3% or something, then that's not as big of a issue. That's right. Not as big, as a, big of a lift. And so here's the other thing to think about, too, which you kind of play out the scenarios. I'm going to build my foundation of safety first because no matter what, I'm better off to have cash in my pocket and savings than to have it sent someone else's pocket, right? And where it's trapped, I can't get to it. And then once I have my reserve built, then I really start hitting those student loans harder. But until then, because let's just play the scenario out. I have my foundation of safety and then I lose my job. Let's say we get a second wave of COVID. We see another round of layoffs or whatever it may be. Real estate market slows down. Interest rates go to 10% in the mortgage business, Jeff. <laughs> right? No. Which I don't think is happening, but I'm just throwing it out there. Well, now I likely qualify for that pay program, don't I? Right? So that's, that's how that plays out. So 
I, I, you, you have to think about all of it, but I think the number one thing is we all have to take measures to protect ourselves from our bad habits. And I think that's what a lot of the program is designed around that you guys are going through. It makes a lot of sense. All right, well, before we wrap up, uh, we had several questions touching on the prepaying of the mortgage and we kind of glazed over it, Jeff. Um, so can you give us your logic on that? And then David just typed in the chat, he has a very specific question. So if Jeff doesn't answer it, then I'll let David unmute and give his scenario. Well, I think, I mean, Brian can speak to it more, but I mean, it's just, you're getting such a low rate and it's tax deductible, so it's helping you on your income typically. I mean, um, it's just a double benefit and it's something that you can leverage. There's no point in putting your money down there when you're paying off a 3% cost, when you could put it into stocks and bonds and earn you know, the 12% over the last however many years, why would you do that? To me, it's not like a smart financial decision to you know, give up 12% to just save a th on a 3% loan. Yeah. Well, and, and, and there's the other part. So that's, that's the opportunity cost part of it. Let's talk about the safety part of it. Let's say that, and I don't know if you guys have read the book, Missed Fortune 101. It's a classic book that you can you know, check out. And the story is, is it's a, a guy who owns a, a business that is a, you know, services Boeing. And this is in the early seventies and Boeing's doing all the layoffs. And there's, you know, there's the, the sign outside of uh, Seattle that says last one out, turn out the lights. And all of a sudden, he's not getting Boeing contacts. He's really suffering. He's almost got his house paid off. This is great, but he has no income now. So he goes to the bank and says, I need to refinance my house because I need access. I need to get to this, to this money, including be able to, so I can pay my mortgage. And guess what the bank said? Well, you have no income. We're not going to lend you any money. So he ended up losing his home when he had it almost paid off. And so you've got to build that foundation of safety first. You've got to get all those other things taken care of first, then work on paying it off. And that's why age 50 is a kind of a milestone because what's typically happening at 50 also? Kids are kind of on their way out of the house too. So, you know, you're likely in your peak income earning years and then the kids are not on, on mom and, the bank of mom and dad as much as they were before. So now you have all this extra money coming. I see this happen all the time with clients. Usually it's around 55 I see nowadays but 50 is a good rule of thumb too. What we coach our clients on a lot is, is you have to decide early on, are you gonna pay your house off or are you never gonna pay it off? Because the middle road of principal and interest for 30 years is not an option. So you have to pick that one early. Because I have some clients that are like, listen, I don't believe in debt, I do not want debt. Okay, that's fine. Now math says you're not better off to do that, but that's fine. Because there is nothing wrong with not having any debt. But there is something wrong with not having any liquidity. So you gotta build that foundation of safety first. I think that goes with the down payment on a house too. Like I always recommend put less down. You know, I have a lot of clients that come to me and they wanna put every last penny they have down yeah. on the house. And I'm That's like, right. why do you wanna do that? Well, I want the lowest payment I can get. Well, why do you wanna do that? Well, in case I lose my job. And I'm saying, okay, well, let's look at it a different way. What if your <laughs> payment is 400 or $500 higher, but now you've got $60,000 in the bank. If you lose your job, now all of a sudden you can make your mortgage payment for the next, you know, how many years? That's right. Calculates out. It's just, it's a safer position. And again, you need a place to live. So you're going to have a mortgage payment or a lease payment or something. You might mm -hmm. as well take advantage of it and build up that savings account that you need, that, that security blanket, basically. Absolutely. And for those people who uh, have not read Miss Fortune 101 that's in, in the group here, it's an easy read. It's, you know, it's about this thick. Uh, it's a really good concept. So any other questions? All right. I think we did it. I think so too. That's awesome. I don't know if Jalen, is everybody muted? Like if they wanted to ask a question, can they? Even Jalen is muted. <laughs> They should be able to take themselves off mute. Okay, if cool. not, just this go ahead and last type chance. in the chat. Last chance. And then um, obviously everyone here has Jeff's contact info. Now you have Brian's. We'll send a follow-up email with that info in it as well. Definitely recommend reaching out to him, um, especially for that Jumpstart program. That's going to be phenomenal. I know I'm signing up for that. Um, and then we'll send out the recording. And as <laughs> things come up, you know, we, we're here to be – your, your counsel and your advisors and on your team, so to speak. So always feel free to reach out to Jeff and our team 
Brian and his team, anytime specific questions comes up, um, come up, we'd love to be there for you guys. So beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, guys. I really thanks appreciate so much, it. Brian, for this was a lot of fun. I, Hope to be invited back. That'll be a sign I did it right. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, I just want to say too that that platform that you guys just rolled out, I am super excited about that. I have so many clients that were looking for an outlet like that. Yep. Get some counseling and then be able to put something together like that. I mean, that is going to be an awesome opportunity. Uh, we're definitely going to be uh, telling all of our clients about that. Beautiful. But anyone on there that is on this class wondering where to start, you just found it. Well, and, and what I'll do next time is I will have Mark come on. He was detained. Had a client pass away, so we're dealing with some estate settlement type issues right now. So he was detained dealing with that, but we'll get him on here and he can take you guys through the Starting Strong program. He's much nicer than I am. You guys will like him. <laughs> all right. Thanks everyone for watching. Appreciate hey. you all. Uh, have a great day and a great weekend coming up. Thanks again, Brian. And thank you. Uh, thanks, Sky and Jalen, for running the show. Appreciate y'all. <laughs>